I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. Three years ago, we released a mini-series entitled Sustainable Investing, The Next Frontier to explore the early landscape for ESG. In the ensuing years, a lot of investor attention has focused on sustainable investing, but differing objectives, measurements, and benchmarks has muddied the playing field. It's a subject I wrote about in a blog last year called What's in a Name? The Problem with ESG. So until those cloudy waters clear up, I thought about turning our attention to a nearly universal area of interest, how capital allocation can improve the climate. This four-part miniseries spans conversations with leading practitioners focusing on climate solutions. We'll hear from hedge fund and climate activist legend Tom Steyer, one of the most long-standing and largest family offices focused on impact investing, and two important strategies in the space, nuclear power and carbon credits. Taken together, we'll learn how some of the top investment minds are working actively to address our long-term climate needs. My guest on the second episode of Climate Solutions is Bill Oram, partner at Capricorn Investment Group, one of the largest and longest standing mission-aligned investment organizations. Capricorn oversees $9 billion across three distinct but related investment strategies, an OCIO serving families and foundations, a seeding business that backs impact asset managers, and the Technology Impact Fund, a venture capital fund focused on clean technology and climate solutions. Bill joined Capricorn 20 years ago in the firm's infancy with the mission to deliver extraordinary investment results by leveraging market forces to scale solutions to global problems with a focus on the climate. Our conversation covers the establishment of an investment program to match Capricorn's mission, the universe of available investment opportunities to address climate solutions, and Capricorn's strategy to implement. We discuss seeding new funds, venture capital, emerging markets, public markets, current opportunities, and the potential for a long-term solution for the world. Before we get going, golf season will be here before you know it. And what better way to prepare than listen to the story of the incredible turnaround of golf equipment manufacturer TaylorMade by KPS in the third episode of Season 2 of Private Equity Deals. The conversation includes a colored history of the brand, a broken deal process, and clever steps taken to turn it from a money loser to a profitable winner. Now, listening in won't much help with your golf swing, but the dizzying number of changes KPS made to a simple business will give you a range of stories to share with your opponent that will get their heads spinning and might cause them to lose focus on a key stroke or two, making the difference between winning and losing your bet or competition. As Bill Murray playing Carl Spackler in the classic movie Caddyshack would say, you've got that going for you, which is nice. Tune in to Private Equity Deals on your favorite podcast player to listen in on Wednesday. Please enjoy my conversation with Bill Oram in the second episode of Climate Solutions. Bill, great to see you. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Why don't we do a quick bit on your background and we'll go from there. Sure. I tell people my background is easy because the vast majority of it's been spent at Capricorn. So I joined the firm about 20 years ago. Prior to Capricorn, I'd gone to Amherst College at a liberal arts education. I wanted to get some practical skills. And so I went into banking. And this was right during the tech bubble and then the subsequent crash. I worked out in Palo Alto. And it was fortuitous for me, I suppose, that for someone that knew so little, I had about the first year to develop some basic skills. And then the market turned and we were understaffed. So I got quite a bit of, of deal experience in a short period of time. It wasn't hard for me to reflect and understand that with my background, I had virtually no purview or understanding of broader investing or capital market. So the one thing that I was looking for coming out of banking 
was something with the broadest remit, somewhere where I could really learn something and then figure out what I was going to do with my life. And so I'd been introduced to the endowment model and a few people that worked at various endowments. And that was really interesting to me. I didn't understand it clearly. I think I appreciated the fact that it was so broad and you could learn about all these different ways to deploy capital. And I found the mission of those endowments to be really compelling in many ways, working so closely on behalf of an institution. And that process led me to Capricorn. So Capricorn was just being formed in the early 2000s. And it had many of the characteristics of an endowment. So it had the breadth of activity. It had the long time horizon. It was different in the sense that one, it was being formed. We were in the process of building out a portfolio. And two, and I think this is core to to what we've been doing over the last 20 years, it had a different aspiration. The goal was to build a different type of investment firm that wouldn't just support our clients' capital needs for philanthropy or, or other purposes, but actually activate the capital while we were managing it. So seek out high rates of return, but do so in such a way as we were looking for opportunities around climate and different impact verticals. So what is Capricorn? As we built the firm over time, we took that original framework and the goal of using the investment capital to amplify and support our client's mission, and we organize in three primary areas. So the first is that we have an OCIO in which we manage multi-asset class portfolios, and we integrate climate and impact throughout. Second, we have a seeding business in which we invest into emerging impact asset managers. And we really view this as critical to the overall objective, which is how can we create different channels and avenues to scale capital going to climate and other impact verticals. And then the third is we have an early stage, growth stage venture fund investing into clean tech businesses. And that's led by my colleagues, Yanni Garaglu and Depender Saluja. Each of these are different clearly, but they're connected in that There are different ways to mobilize capital and scale solutions oriented towards climate. So that's how we are structured today. Of course, it all started with the original partnership with Jeff Skoll and the Skoll Foundation. And Jeff and the foundation were really unique in that very early, they were open to the idea and wanted to use all of their resources, including their financial capital, to address big structural issues like climate. So we benefited quite a bit from their interest and their partnership, which in turn allowed us to explore some of these areas from an investment context. So in the case of Jeff, he was the founding president of eBay. He wrote the company's business plan. And after eBay, he's really committed himself, his capital, his time to looking for opportunities to promote transformational social and environmental change. So he created the Skoll Foundation. He created Participant Media, which is a diversified media company, which is intended to inspire and compel change with really high quality content. So they've done documentaries like Inconvenient and Truth. They've done features like Green Book and Spotlight. And Participant and Skoll Foundation are unique in that they're looking for different ways to scale and reach a broader audience and look for those leverage points in philanthropic or media context. And in the case of Capricorn, we take a very similar approach but we put it into an investment context. So where are there scale opportunities? Where are there points in the system where we can introduce different innovations and be well compensated for using that approach? And how did you go about tackling that investment challenge? When we started the firm, the general consensus was endowment capital should be entirely distinct from the mission of an institution. Over time, firms like Generation proved out or illustrated that you could introduce and integrate sustainability and these broader frameworks into an investment process, and it could be additive to risk-adjusted returns. At the same time, you had a number of foundations that were looking at carve-outs or using a specific sleeve of their foundation capital to look at opportunities in and around impact or climate. And I think what's exciting about where we are today is there's broad recognition that an issue like climate is both a systemic risk and opportunity in terms of long-term financial returns. There's also a broad recognition that has applicability across a diversified portfolio for an asset owner. So it's not just one sleeve or one part of a portfolio. It has applicability across all asset classes, the entire risk spectrum. So private, public, equity, credit. And therefore, it's just much more relevant to think about it holistically in a portfolio. And I think from an asset owner's standpoint, what we're seeing is that more and more, they're also realizing 
that they have this endowment capital and it can be a very powerful mechanism to amplify and support whatever their mission is. So they're much more open to using that balance sheet in a much more comprehensive way. We ultimately gravitated to a model that had very similar characteristics to the endowment model in terms of the breadth of asset classes, the level of diversification, long-term orientation. We, like I think any investment firm, put our own imprint on it. And our imprint was seeking out things in climate and in and around some of the various impact verticals where we thought they were undercapitalized, where we could earn high rates of return, or at least market rates of return, and which we thought we could have a competitive advantage relative to other market participants. About 60 to 70% of our portfolio is oriented towards strategies addressing climate change. About 20% is oriented towards financial inclusion and seeking different ways to get capital to undercapitalize entrepreneurs, businesses, segments of the economy, communities, et cetera. And then there's about 10%, which is generally broader portfolio instruments and things that we hold for purposes of managing the portfolio. What were the different ways that you've participated in that combination of investment dollars and activating the capital over the years? So none of us came from an endowment. Stephen George and Yanya de Garaglu, who remains my partner today, came from different backgrounds than you would typically have if you were managing a large institutional pool of capital. And I think that was by design. As we thought about investing the capital, one, we ultimately are oriented towards growing the capital base over time, also supporting the payout as needed for Jeff Skoll and the Skoll Foundation and the other families and foundations we manage money for. But to do that, in a highly diversified manner. And so we started investing across asset classes. And I think as we evolved, we had a grounding in innovation and entrepreneurship. As we thought about impact and innovation and specifically climate, I think it was pretty clear to us early on that technology and breakthroughs around entrepreneurship would be pretty critical to addressing uh, the climate challenge. So we started there and Jan led an investment in Tesla. And as you can imagine, that then started to open up a network connectivity to different types of companies. But importantly, it wasn't just in venture. It was then in how do you actually deploy some of these technologies at scale? So I think we've always benefited from the breadth of the portfolio. So everything from early stage venture to real assets and the deployment of capital into the real economy, if you will, and then everything in between. As you've looked at, and particularly with this lens of climate over these 20 years, how would you map out the landscape of different types of opportunities as you're trying to invest to impact climate solutions? It's certainly expanded over time. And so if you go back to maybe the initial framework in the early 2000s, I think there was climate solutions and really innovation on the venture side. There was the starting of real asset deployment, so renewable power infrastructure. And in our view, those type of opportunities were really mispriced for the risk. It was a new asset class. And I think you were able to do that type of development and earn very high rates of return relative to the risk. But then within the public markets, really the only avenue for an investment was divestment and an immediate default to just excluding those extractive industries. And I think there's probably strong rationale for that. But I think as we've expanded over the last 20 years, I think there are opportunities across the breadth of industries. And frankly, there's a strong need for a decarbonization of the overall economy. So divestment and climate solutions, in my view, deal with the two pillars. But about 80% are going to fall somewhere in between. It's how do you decarbonize a heavy industry? How do you decarbonize buildings in the built environment? Obviously, transportation. And so you need to really activate the entirety of the balance sheet to deal with the global economy, not just what I would call divestment and solely climate solutions, although those are really big parts of it. What were some of the early mistakes you made? I think every investment organization needs to have a reasonably clear identity. And I think it's okay for an investment organization to acknowledge whatever mental models they have. Everyone has biases and areas where they've made money and areas maybe where they haven't. And I think early on, we probably weren't as aggressive in going more strongly towards climate and impact and maybe keeping a leg in some of the more traditional segments of the economy. 
we developed, I think, competitive advantages and networks that made us stronger and more able to compete and likely earn higher rates of return in these areas where, frankly, fewer people were active. But like all investment organizations, you don't want to deviate too far from everyone else. And so I think what we learned over time is that you continue to focus and devote resources into areas where you can develop competitive advantages. And that more than compensates you for maybe not covering the full market. And what does that look like today? Oftentimes when we describe our mission and our impact orientation, people think they're going to see this portfolio that looks completely unlike anything they've seen. And in practice, at an asset allocation level, and this is really the true north around how we invest, we have about 60% of the capital in various forms of equities, public and private, about 20% of the capital in real assets. Those real assets tend to be more contractual, more infrastructure-like, just because of the nature of what we're doing. So not nearly as volatile as you might see in traditional commodities, about 10% in independent return forms of specialty financed, hedged, and then about 10% in liquid. When we look through it, and I look at a lot of peer institutions and try to understand how we compare or contrast to them, at the highest level, our overall risk profile, our liquidity profile, it doesn't look terribly different. I think we start to look quite different at the underlying asset level in terms of the type of strategies that we gravitate to within each of those big buckets of assets. What are the most important levers that you're thinking about to ensure that the investments you're making have as much of an impact as you'd like to? It's a good question. So we benefit from having the full suite of tools. We have folks that do venture capital, but we also have a balance sheet that can absorb lower risk, lower returning asset-based investments. And understanding the connectivity between those two things, I think is pretty critical to doing both very well. Our entire portfolio, we look at carbon baselining. So we calculate the emissions of our entire portfolio. And then from there, because we have committed to a net zero goal, we're really looking to decarbonize our portfolio, both through changes in what our underlying companies are doing, changes in asset allocation as needed, and then also doing offsets for any residual amount over the next 10 to 20 years. So as we think about the different levers, so the biggest is the venture side. So we're not going to address climate change and carbon emissions without various forms of innovation in transportation, mobility, power generation, storage. And then importantly, I think in the last few years, an increased recognition of the importance of industrial decarbonization, as well as the built environment. And I think there's a lot of technology innovations going into those areas. But this is ultimately about scale. So you can have all the innovation that you want if you can't figure out how to mobilize the global capital markets to get those dollars out, you won't be able to address the challenge. And so that's been a big part of our focus around renewable infrastructure, regenerative agriculture, big dollar amounts where there's significant potential scale, and those things have to work together. I think the third piece is offsets. So no one that looks at the carbon challenge and the evolution of how do you keep within the Paris Agreement one and a half degree framework sees a pathway without using offsets and carbon sinks. And I know that they're controversial and it's not a perfect framework as of yet, but the truth is that as we wait for companies to decarbonize, and that will happen, and I think there are some green shoots around that, and as we wait for global power generation to shift to a more renewable standard. There's a lot that financial actors can do and asset owners around offsets. Frankly, it's one of the few things that an asset owner can do because it's companies that actually have to decarbonize. And of course, you can be activist and you can be supportive, but it's ultimately companies that have to do the hard work of decarbonizing their own operations. Similarly, you can fund and finance renewable power generation, which I think is critical. We're on a very good pathway there, but we still need to figure out how to do more around actually taking carbon out of the atmosphere and rolling it back to some degree. And I think there's a lot around nature-based solutions as well as technology-based solutions that could be really interesting over the next 5, 10, 15 years. This idea of Look, the carbon emissions is happening at the company level. 
you can only do so much at the company level. As you've gone about investing the foundation capital, how have you decided when to invest directly so you can have more of an impact compared to, okay, we're going to invest in a manager who's doing something that we think we like, but then is again one step removed? To cover the breadth of the global landscape and to go as deep as you likely need to go in some of these areas required a lot of specialization. So I think we had a decision to make, which is, do we grow Capricorn into this massive investment organization? Or do we try to keep decision-making within a small group of people and leverage the power of external partnerships? And so we kind of took a hybrid approach, which is that we got very active in incubating or seeding or partnering with early stage asset managers so we could get the benefit of some of that proximity to the underlying assets and the work, but where we could also benefit from the fact that there's just a lot more breadth and capability when you use external partnerships. And further, as we evolved over time, there's this question of, does it matter if Capricorn invests in a sustainable and impactful manner? You know, I think it does. It's certainly been accretive to our returns. And I think we've met our clients' objectives around aligning the capital. But in the scheme of things, the truth is it doesn't matter because the scale of capital required is so great that unless you're being influential in either influencing or enabling other asset owners to invest in that way, then you're probably not fulfilling the mission to the degree that I think we wanted to. So it's always been about how can we not just invest our capital in this manner, but also be a positive contributor to the overall shift. What's your experience been in backing managers in this space? Overall, it's been both fulfilling for the team in terms of the experience of creating new ventures. It's taking a venture capital model to the asset management industry, which I think is very fun and exciting. From a return standpoint, we look at our returns, as many do, in all sorts of different ways. And there's no question that it's been highly accretive to the overall results. And I think part of that is, going back to the start, is leaving aside the impact or the focus on climate, in our opinion, it's a reasonably good starting point to focus in areas where others aren't, or there's some perceived reason that one can't make money there. You go to undercapitalized segments of the economy where maybe there are barriers to entry or what have you, and you back a very highly capable team. And I think more often than not, good things will happen. You may have to have a different time horizon than a short-term trading you know, operation. And there may be challenges along the way, but overall, that's a reasonably good place to start. So I think we've started in a rich area for returns and alpha generation. And so we've backed 25 firms over the last 15 years, a couple per year. Some have had incredible commercial success and grown to become very large organizations. Some haven't. But overall, it's been a positive experience for us as a firm. As I said, no question, it's been accretive overall. What are some of the ones that have achieved that kind of success? A few that you've had on your show. So Vision Ridge is one. And that's a good example of part of what we've tried to create over time. So we had started to invest into a fair amount of renewable power generation, water, agriculture, sustainably managed. And the scale of that activity got so much larger than our balance sheet could manage. And frankly, the specialization as more and more high quality investment firms came into the space necessitated that we put more of a dedicated focus on it. And so what we did was we actually contributed our assets. And then the team at Capricorn that had been managing those assets left and they partnered with Ruben Munger at Vision Ridge. And to their collective credit, they've built just an incredibly high quality investment organization. That's certainly been one really positive. How is the diligence in one of these newer managers different, not just because they're an early stage manager, but because you have this particular axe for this space and there may not be as many players? Impact and climate investing has evolved over time. You know, Ruben Munger, for example, had a long career at Baupost. He was not a new investor by any means. But we were trying to create something new, and he was applying a skill set that he had developed at Baupost and then subsequently with his own capital to this emerging area. So you're not starting from scratch in terms of the mental models that they use to underwrite assets. Very rarely are we dealing with a true 
emerging manager, if you will. More often than not, I think what's really exciting about what's happening in the world today is you have people with really strong technical skills and investment experience, and they're making a decision to apply those skills to climate investing. And so there's a lot to work with, I would say, in terms of the diligence. Of course, with any emerging firm, whether that's impact-oriented or not, you're not going to have the same level of data or information in terms of how they operate with sequential and linear information. But you do have a mosaic around all of the different things that they've done over time. You have the ability to develop relationships with them in a way that's, I think, fundamentally different and superior to that which you could develop with an established firm. And so we leverage all of that. And we also try to make our involvement to the extent we can about more than the capital. And everyone would like that to be the case, but we are a mission-driven organization. We do want to see these firms grow and scale and ultimately amplify their impact. So we provide a lot of services to them around marketing, operations, impact. And when you interact with someone as a partner, as opposed to maybe just a customer, you start to see a bit more about their own belief systems, values. And so all of that, I think, informs a level of diligence that's useful. How do you think about scale? You're talking about climate solutions, which is clearly a global problem. What happens in China and India affects what we might be able to do here. There is this notion of, okay, you have a lot of capital dedicated to it. You're one of back managers that have some scale. Where do you come at the pressure points where you think we can make the biggest difference? It's interesting as you think about scale. Going back to venture, there can be very small investments that have extraordinary scale associated with them. And let's take Tesla as one example. So obviously for us, that was an early stage venture investment. The ultimate financial value became evident, the value of it as it relates to decarbonizing transportation is also significant, but the actual dollars deployed in our case were reasonably small and ultimately grew over time. And then on top of that, there is what Tesla did in the OEM industry overall, which is it effectively brought forward the plans of all the other large automakers by likely 10 or 20 years. That's an enormous amount of impact on a reasonably small dollar investment in our case. And of course, we weren't the only ones involved, but we were involved very early. On the other end of the spectrum, there is things that are happening around renewable infrastructure in particular, where it's really just about getting the cost of capital down to a level at which it can crowd in much larger pools of capital than ours. And so, as I mentioned, in the mid-2000s, we could do renewable infrastructure and earn rates of return that were very attractive for our capital. 10, 12, 15%. And then if you're able to aggregate a portfolio and sell it, you could do even better. And I think some of our partners were able to do that. That's really difficult today because of the competition in the marketplace, increased understanding of what is the nature of those cash flows and what is the real risk. One of our big areas of focus is dealing with the asset management industry overall. The typical fee load applied to that activity is a real deterrent to crowding in large pools of capital. They aren't assets that have the optionality that can really absorb a 2 and 20 or a 1 and 20 fee load. So a lot of the innovation that we've been working on has been around how do you create different vehicles to absorb this capital, whether it be evergreen or blended finance models, how can you create structures that can get to the scale of the $20 billion that's needed to start to build some of the very large infrastructure that's required. What's an example of one of the most effective structures you've seen? So we like the evergreen structures quite a bit. Look, there's a whole industry in real estate around open-ended vehicles and interval funds. That's a massive asset management industry. And we don't see a reason why similar structures couldn't be created in renewables. How have you thought about the emerging market aspect of climate solution? It is obviously the core of the issue, I think, for many that look at this challenge, which is if you look at global emissions, 40% plus is now coming from China, India, and that will only grow over time. And they are on a growth trajectory, which will necessitate further emissions absent some massive change. Then we can talk about Indonesia and some of the other large markets, which are also contributing significant emissions. But 
we've tried to figure out different ways, we and others and development institutions, of how do you get more capital into those markets to deal with their power sector and the industrial decarbonization that has to happen. And it's a very difficult challenge. So I can't say that I have a great answer. But one of the things that's come out of the Inflation Reduction Act is a different pathway, which is, I think the consensus prior to the last couple of years was somehow there was going to be this massive coalition that came together and we're going to figure out some transfer of capital that would enable private sector to be crowded in. I think competition may ultimately be the solution in the sense that the Inflation Reduction Act was really about American manufacturing, jobs, energy security, and making America the leader in the energy transition and enabling it, and then leveraging that technology advantage to then have that transferred into the benefit of the global economy. And I think as you go from globalization to regionalization, globalized energy complex to maybe that one that's a bit more distributed, I think it's going to be harder and harder just to hope that capital is flowing into some of these emerging markets and you have to likely win on technology solutions and getting that cost down to a level at which it can then be implemented and deployed locally. So take the example of Indonesia, one of many countries that will look to grow. And historically, there's been a tremendous amount of dirty energy emitted in that process. How do you think about a country that's had less stable regimes than others needing to have infrastructure in place so that down the road, whatever it is that's fueling their growth can contribute to what we're trying to get to globally. The climate problem is not just an environmental problem. It's a social challenge too. And the impact of climate change will be felt disproportionately by the most vulnerable and poorest countries. So I don't think it's fair to entirely relieve those countries of some obligation because they are ultimately going to absorb a significant amount of the cost. And development institutions are working on these issues around how do you create different pools and concessionary first loss, insurance vehicles. There's a lot going on, but the scale of the challenge is so great that as of now, we haven't made nearly as much progress as one would have hoped. Just come back to there is no path around addressing climate change without the innovation and technology and breakthroughs flywheel working hand in hand with deployment. So it, it is ultimately about a lot of what I think is happening in Palo Alto and Silicon Valley, and then finding different avenues to get that actually implemented in some of these emerging markets. There's still a ton of money in the public markets. And as you've looked at this over the years, would love to get your perspective on how deploying capital into the public markets can have that positive force for climate solutions. I think the number is something like 40% of global emissions are attributable to public companies. So it's material. I think the challenge historically has been it's difficult to isolate. It's very diffuse in terms of how those emissions actually are coming into the system. Look, there's clearly climate solutions. We've seen in the last 10 years, more acceptance in the public markets and frankly, more need to finance some of these solution providers get them to scale and ultimately manufacture and then deploy whatever product or solution they have. So those are reasonably easy. And we've been quite active in the last 15 years in either having owned those companies in the private side and then them going public or backing managers that are reasonably well-equipped. Utilities, I think, is a significant part of global emissions, clearly. But within the public markets in particular, it's probably one of the more interesting ways to express climate advocacy and engagement in that it's such a big part of emissions. And I think there's no question that there's a bifurcation on different utilities, and their plan to get to net zero and their plan for an energy transition. So I think those are strategies where we think there's actually quite a bit of both impact and return potential. And then there's the Googles of the world, which generally speaking, they have the financial resources and aspiration to be entirely powered by renewable energy, decarbonize their entire operations. And those are, I don't want to say easy, but those climate leaders are well understood. The interesting aspect over the next 10 years is everything in between. And it's looking at those companies and their transition and energy transition pathways and what those could be. And I think really understanding 
the risk and opportunity embedded in that bulk of the global economy. So what are their physical risks? What is their cost of capital risk? How does an energy transition impact their forward revenues, profit margins? What multiple would you put on a business that is on a strong pathway versus one that remains exposed? And I think those are going to be the opportunities that we will be focused on and I think are pretty critical, again, to a net zero pathway. What have you seen through the managers you use in how measurement works? And they're looking at particularly public companies to see as a variable into their decision about valuation and how a company's doing on that lens. Yeah, I think in the public markets, it's not straightforward and it's not silver bullet either. But I think there's a broad recognition and understanding that climate risk is material to forward enterprise value. And so, again, I think it's it's obviously the qualitative things around strategy, governance, acknowledgement of these risks. I think it's organizations that are engaged in pathway around how can they decarbonize their operations over a certain period of time. But I think it's fundamentally about looking at the energy transition risk, physical risk, and trying to connect that as deeply as one can to the fundamentals of the business around what is changing around demand, what is potentially changing around the volatility of inputs in their own operations. And I don't want to say it's simple because it's not. But I also don't think it's rocket science or totally disconnected from how high quality equity investor with a long time horizon would think about a business to start with. So I think it's just about going a bit deeper around the climate risk as that becomes more fundamental. How far along are we when you're looking at the public companies that your managers are investing in, in those companies being able to measuring their emissions and changes in emissions enough to understand just as a baseline? In the public sphere, I think it's actually reasonably deep. I think scope three, which is the catch-all for the global economy, is complex with a lot of double counting. But scope one and two emissions, which is really the directly attributable emissions for most companies, there's been a lot of work put into that. And I think certainly in the US, it's reasonably deep in terms of the understanding. And then also, depending on the company and their level of interest in this, various pathways to reduce that over the coming years. When we look at our overall portfolio, we have about a third of the carbon intensity of, of a similarly sized global equity portfolio. We've taken out what I would call the easy stuff, right, around really the heavy emitters. But we still have a plan to further decarbonize and engage and hopefully influence our managers who in turn influence the companies. So we're not stopping there, but we started at a reasonably good place. What's interesting is that still... About 70% of our emissions in our portfolio are attributable to about 20 companies. Sometimes the paralysis sets in of this is such a difficult problem, and how could we even go about thinking about it in a highly diversified portfolio? And so I think what we've always been reasonably good at is starting from a foundational place and just trying to work through it and not allowing the perfect to be the enemy of the good. And so we know that there's about 20 companies that... One, they're emitting significant carbon today. And so are we being paid for that? We're definitely not. We're not divesting of all carbon. I think it's about understanding what the externalities are, understanding what the risk is, and are we being appropriately compensated for it? So a lot of that carbon in our portfolio comes from utility companies that are on a pathway to transitioning. If we're right, those companies will be ultimately more valuable in the future because there'll be better position, the cash flows will be capitalized at a higher level, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there are other companies where frankly, doing that exercise, you do wonder, are we actually being compensated for that carbon risk and that impact? And in those cases, we either have managers who are actually focused on engagement and it's part of the plan. And that's the hard work of changing a business's operations. I think that's been proven over time to be something that investors can be compensated for, or we have to make a different decision. When you're bringing in those two areas where clearly there's a mission to reduce carbon and you also have this economic return. What have you found in comparing the quote unquote good company, so low carbon emissions, to a worse company getting better? I think markets are very efficient and reasonably forward looking. I think in general, we're focused on the companies where maybe not the worst. <laughs> I think there's a level at which we may not want to be exposed given our focus, but that are okay but they have a really interesting pathway to being very strong. And I think there's an opportunity to be compensated well for that with a long time horizon. I think one of the challenges is that with sustainability or climate, 
it's inherently long-term oriented. I think there's a lot of urgency to take action today, but those financial returns, it's not like a trading operation where you see it so quickly. So I think those things have to be acknowledged. Ultimately, I think markets price in those good actors and they're valued at a certain level. And so they may still compound it at nice rates, but probably the more interesting opportunities are otherwise. Even in the private side, where so much of renewable infrastructure is priced, it's likely below our cost of capital. It may be more appropriate for pension funds or other large pools. And that's our whole goal. We want to take the first risk and then hopefully prove that out. But where we do take risk is in development or community solar or in some of the areas where there's a bit more hair on the situation and you can earn much higher rates of return as you transition an asset that people thought had some purpose and in fact has a completely different utilization around the energy transition. There are certain examples, you said, that are on one tail or the other. There's a venture in a solar company that's clearly moving in the direction you want. And then there's this big swath of companies in the middle. When you're assessing, it could be a manager or a specific opportunity, I'd love to hear an example of the tension between the objective of reducing emissions, other attributes, but it could be in the company or in your case, a manager. I think the honest answer is that we're not doing ourselves a service nor the portfolio if we're willing to accept concessions. There's a spectrum of capital that one can use from philanthropy to PRI, to market rate, to really seeking out the best rates of return. And we really try as much as we can to fall into that market rate and earning exceptional rates of return because we're doing something different. So I don't know if we ever explicitly acknowledge that trade-off of, wow, this is so impactful that we're willing to accept a concession. I don't think that's bad, by the way. I think sometimes people speak of concessionary investing in the context of it, think it has an extraordinary purpose. It's just that we were formed to do something slightly different. What are some of the lessons or things that you've learned from doing this over the years that someone who hasn't been as focused on the space hasn't gotten to yet? Well, I'll tell you in the seeding activity, because we've learned a lot about that. It's primarily the people involved. So one, I think every investment firm, whether it's impact or not, needs to have a pretty clear true north and identity. And I think where we've had less success than we would have hoped is that things don't go exceedingly well early. People tend to gravitate back towards what's traditional and comfortable. It's always better just to press whatever advantage you think. So be as differentiated as you can. And I think where we've seen firms not make it is they've come back to a traditional model. Two, I think one of the more exciting things about this space, and David Blood at Generation had mentioned this to me a long time ago, and it always stuck with me, it was the human capital element. If you create a firm that has a mission and has a big aspiration, the probabilities of you being able to attract really great people is that much higher in a highly efficient market where you have really great people and they have all sorts of options. But one of the things that we learned as we've seen more and more people shift from quote unquote traditional investing to something with an impact is the context matters in the sense that it's hard to take someone that's run a big investment organization and put them into a smaller one. And that's just common sense. I've certainly made the mistake of occasionally not quite understanding different environments in which individuals succeed or not. Over the last couple of years, there's been so much more focus and attention on so the ESG that alongside of that, you have terms like greenwashing. What are some of the examples of things that you've seen over the last few years that you never would have seen before environmentally focused investing was a thing? Yeah, I read last week that something like a third of all assets are now ESG assets. I think the ESG industry and complex deserves to be criticized and one should have some cynicism about it. There's this wonderful chart showing ESG assets going up and to the right and then global emissions going up and to the right. And <laughs> so you do have to ask, what is the purpose of it? I think sustainable investing is a perfectly reasonable way to invest thinking holistically about the externalities, thinking about the durability of the economic model such that it's not extractive in any way. I think that's very prudent. I think many investors, well before ESG was a term, if they've been around for 30 years, they likely incorporated some version of that. But that's very different from impact. 
impact has real intentionality and you're really looking to solve a very specific problem with capital. I would say that even we've evolved from, I think sustainable is encompasses everything we do just in terms of how we think about being a long-term asset owner, but we're really focused on trying to have real impact with our capital. What areas of your portfolio are you most excited about today? This hasn't yet happened in the energy transition, but I think because of what occurred in the last couple of years in the current environment that we're in, I think there's going to be a very interesting opportunity around distressed investing in clean tech, where you have really good assets, but their capital structure or the way that they were financed makes it more difficult to get further financing. And so I think you're going to see people with those skill sets probably come into the market, and that could be a very good way to move from a growth and momentum-oriented market to one that may be more well-capitalized for building out the infrastructure, the manufacturing. And those are skill sets that those type of investors bring to bear. Nature-based solutions, natural climate solutions, I mean, that is very likely. It has to be part of the solution, and I think it will very likely be a burgeoning area. So we're spending a lot of time on the picks and shovels of it. So looking at project finance, but also looking at all of the infrastructure associated with nature-based solutions. What else is very interesting? I think on the venture side and growth side, I think, again, moving more into industrial decarbonization and thinking about what are the solutions and technologies in these very hard to abate sectors that aren't going anywhere and they're contributing a significant amount to the emissions. So I think you're seeing more and more excitement and innovation in those areas. How does the changing economic environment, both rates in particular, commodity prices, impact what you're seeing in fund flows? It's interesting in the sense that if you just maybe broaden that question to what happened over the past year, of course, overall markets and valuations have adjusted in virtually every segment, not just in clean technology and climate. But a lot of what happened underneath that, particularly given the war in the Ukraine and what's happened in Europe, I think in particular, there's been a massive acceleration towards this idea of energy security and resilience of systems, as people have cited, and then affordability and not being exposed to some of the volatility of traditional energy. So I think underneath what seems to be a resurgence of oil and gas and traditional power generation has been really strong trends for renewables and climate. I think you see this most clearly in Europe, where that's just resulted in a massive acceleration. When you say flows, if you look at the underlying flows around renewable power deployment, projects getting started with the Inflation Reduction Act, I mean, a massive amount of capital is now flowing into the US for manufacturing around some of these issues. So the flow of capital has been reasonably significant on the positive, and that's not intuitive. But if you think about where are there secular long term growth trends that likely have some positive structural advantages, I mean, this would be one of the first areas that you would look. So our next two episodes are going to be about nuclear and then carbon markets. I would love to get your impression of the importance of both, both in your portfolio and going forward in the markets. I'll defer to Jan and other technologists around nuclear, but we do have that exposure and I think it's highly relevant around something that could be really transformative. I think carbon is much more near-term actionable for us in terms of the scale of dollars that we're putting into it. And so there's the regulated carbon markets. And then I think What's been in focus in the last couple of years is the voluntary carbon market. And what role will the voluntary carbon market play in really addressing the residual emissions? So even as we decarbonize, there's broad acknowledgement that we're not going to be able to decarbonize fully by 2050. And so you're going to have to look at sinks. The market that can absorb the most significant amount of capital today is nature-based, afforestation, reforestation. And then also, why don't we just start with just avoiding deforestation and creating the right mechanisms for those communities and actors to maintain those assets. And so I think carbon markets and ultimately putting a price on that carbon is pretty critical to the next 30 years of emissions pathway. So you've been at this for 20 years. For all I know, you may be at it for the next 20. What's your level of optimism about the challenges we're facing given what you've seen over the last 20 years and what you can project going forward? I think there's broad acceptance of the science, maybe not as much in the the US, but certainly on a global basis. And I think broad acceptance on the materiality of climate risk as it relates to global economies. And I think that's resulted in a real acceleration in terms of the level of focus and activity. And I do think 
well, it's always controversial when you see these large asset management firms really starting to shift their focus, build large scale products around these issues. That gives me a reasonable amount of optimism. I think in the venture landscape, it's very rare that you run into any venture capital firm these days that doesn't have some sort of focus on climate. And I think that's usually a pretty strong indicator, as I said a few times. I mean, I think ultimately technology and innovation will be core to this. So those are all give me some level of optimism. I mean, I think in the last 10 years, I think global emissions have only increased a handful of percentage points. And we've still managed to grow global economy reasonably well. So it can be done. Now we have to do even more. But if I think about the amount of focus on this in 2023 relative to 2013, it's significantly more. And the prospects for large-scale deployment and also the innovation is, is probably great. I think the emerging markets, specifically China and India, are obviously a challenge. This new framework of competition may very well be the solution that was missing in the sense that if you start to force the level of competition that I think some of the US policy envisions, you will likely see an acceleration across the global landscape, which is interesting. It's counterintuitive. It'll definitely cost more money, by the way. I'm not an economist, but we know that there's leakage when you don't have fully globalized economy, and that's the same for climate. Conversely, ambition and seeking out prosperity for each individual country might be a very strong stimulant to all of this activity. Well, Bill, I can't let you go without asking you a couple of closing questions that you know are coming. So what is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Well, I'd be remiss since I'm talking to you to not mention men's league hockey. <laughs> <laughs> I spend a lot of time in hockey rinks with my kids, but this is something that I just do on Sundays and it's a great way to be outside. It's a great group of people. So it's something I look forward to. What type of investment do you gravitate to like a moth to the flame? I am very attracted to forms of specialty finance. I think it's really hard to compound capital at abnormally high rates of return for long periods of time. So things where you can earn a good, but maybe not exceptional rate of return, but you can keep that capital out and allow it to compound, I think is really powerful. It's great to watch a business that has a really well-functioning origination engine, and they're able to find these niches. And I think it has a lot of applicability for climate. What's your biggest investment pet peeve? It would have to be incongruence. And again, just trying to stay on topic with the impact. I think the impact space, NESG, has done itself a disservice in how it prices its product. So you have these people that are trying to really have exceptional impact, and then they show up to talk to us and their fee load is egregious. And they don't quite understand the incongruence between those two things. When you have an investment firm where they have a fee load or a structure that doesn't align with the strategy, it's really off-putting to me. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? My dad, who obviously has had more important impact on me personally, but professionally, he was a municipal finance banker. Even early on, you know, he had done a lot in affordable housing and raising money for critical infrastructure. So early on, I had a sense that you could do things in finance and have some sort of positive impact with it. So that was something that was really influential to me. And then I would have to say my partner, Yanya de Garaglu. I think Jan deserves a lot of the credit for really setting the vision of Capricorn and focusing on staying true to the mission is this phrase of, if you work on important things, they're more resilient. So it's not obvious, but if you're working on things that matter, more often than not, you can find solutions in different ways. What was the most challenging moment in your career? We've had periods of challenging investment results and underperformance and these sorts of things. Interestingly, it's actually been the last two years because we had really extraordinary gains. We benefited quite a bit, as many did. But in 2020, we really saw the culmination of a lot of our work. And what's been interesting is, how do you rebalance a portfolio from those gains to have it be well-suited for the going forward environment? How do you continue to invest around innovation and trying to move the ball forward while also managing the overall defensiveness and risk profile of the portfolio? Look, fortunately for us, we've managed to work through that, but it's been a real challenge to balance those tensions. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? I often say, you know, everybody's working on something. It works on both ways. It works to not be terribly cynical with others. 
be a bit introspective. And then conversely, when you're in a challenging period, you know, to also understand that everybody's working on their own issues. And so I think it's comforting to just always be aware of that on both sides. All right, Bill, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? I think it would have to be to just focus on doing a small number of things really well. Well, Bill, thanks so much for sharing your knowledge and experience in this space. Thank you. It was great. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com, where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time. Thank you.